I'm, I'm going to do a very brief introduction of Paul because we've all bragged on Paul enough that you know his incredible credentials. Um, one of America's great editors, winner of all kinds of awards, um, long list of <laughs> he's shaking Stop. his head. <laughs> okay, that's Paul. But Michael, you guys don't know. Um, and so I'm going to take a little more time with Michael. Um, Michael is, uh, is really one of um, the world's most beloved film critics. Um, he was Rolling Stone's first film critic. Um, he's been a contributing editor and online critic for film comment uh, for years and years. Uh, he has written for the New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New York Times, uh, was a longtime critic for the Baltimore Sun, um, writes for the Criterion Collection, um, and has written numerous books, including Victor Fleming, an American movie master, which won the 2009 Mayfield uh, Prize, which is the top honor for arts writing. Um, and he's written for the Library of America, uh, a bi-weekly feature called The Movie Goer, uh, and we're really grateful to have him here joining Paul, the two are old friends. Um, we just as, as a as a warning, um, we're in the new era of film exhibition in which everything happens on the film curator's MacBooks, as opposed to in projection booths. So um, my uh, MacBook is slightly being slightly temperamental with me. We're going to make it all work. It's actually not the computer. But we're working out some new, some challenges of the new era in, in film viewing. So bear with us if I stumble a little bit on some of these film cues that Paul and Michael have chosen for us. Um, and I want, just want to say a, another thank you to all of you for being here and to Paul Barnes and to Michael Trago. Okay, Paul, I'm you're up. on. Am I up? <laughs> <laughs> Can everybody hear me? My yeah. audio is okay? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Good. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Um, I was really excited when Jason called me and said that uh, he was thinking about showing Band of Outsiders, uh, which is one of my favorite Godard films. Uh, and I hadn't seen it for, I don't know, 20, 30 years or something. So it was kind of exciting to uh, be asked to do it. Uh, I just remembered how much fun um, it was and how different it was at the time in 1964. Um, and then, um, you know, as we've been doing with a lot of these programs to have a, a discussion with a partner, and, and I thought of, of um, my friend Michael Sregau. Two of us went together at NYU, and uh, this was the era of the French New Wave and the era of Truffaut and Godard, and I thought, you know, maybe Michael would want to join me, and he graciously said he would. So, uh, Michael, are you there? Are you I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I just, I just can't see you. You can't in, uh, see me. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere. I can see myself somehow, but I. <laughs> but I'm here. Okay. I'm here, and I, I just want to say it's a great pleasure to be here. I uh, love getting the chance to uh, see a great old movie again, uh, and one that I hadn't seen in a while, and one that evokes uh, just so much. Uh, flavor of a time of life that I was in as well as the filmmakers and that was really the case with uh, Band of Outsiders. I mean I, I was caught up in trying to develop some other uh, you know long-term things while we're here in this weird uh, world where we're working not working and um, uh, you called I, I popped the blu-ray in and uh, just the texture of this movie just the uh, sustained kind of lyric feel of it uh, right. just transported me and uh, so I was really grateful to uh, to be able to talk about it, see it again and talk about it with you. Good, good, okay. Well listen, just before we start the discussion, I just thought it might be fun uh, to give a kind of overall flavor of the film, which actually happens right in the opening credits. Um, Michael and I talked about this the other day, so Jason, if you could run the opening credits clip and then uh, on the other side of that, Michael and I can take off on this discussion.
go. Okay. That's good, Jason. You can stop. A typical Godard transition. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love the comment. I mean, I love that, you know, he was uh, uh, all about editing, which was like really revolutionary at the time, uh, yes. especially in his circle, because uh, he came out of uh, Cahiers de Cinema, as did the core of the group we know as the French New Wave, including, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, Truffaut, his friend, Francois Truffaut, uh, uh, and Eric Romer and uh, Jacques Rivette. Uh, and uh, the guru of that group was this great critic who, if you haven't read, you should read, called Andre Bazin. And he was all about uh, the holiness of reality and, and, and getting a full sense of reality from a movie and filming things in deep focus and letting a scene play out. There was something almost religious about that for, um, uh, for Bazin. Godard was all about forward motion. <laughs> yes. For, for, Godard uses every tool, including a uh, deep focus, but uh, uh, he is about uh, the connections you make between images. Uh, right. In fact, even in the middle of this movie, he does what's a famous ex experiment and film students read about called the Kuleshov effect, where, uh, Kuleshov effect, where you take an impassive portrait of a person and you see how it changes through editing, through the context that the editor puts it in. And right. uh, I love that in these credits, he's giving you these fast jabs of, of these three main characters, uh, played by Claude Brasseur and Sammy Fry and um, Anna Karina. Uh, and uh, he's doing it in a way that's uh, playful. Uh, so you kind of can relax with this film immediately. It, it's a little off-putting, the jauntiness of the music is so aggressive that you're yeah. sort of set off bounds. So he kind of, makes you ready for anything. Uh, right. And yet also, as you see about 10, 15 minutes in, he's referring to a scene that's really one of the pivotal movies, pivotal scenes in the movie, which is the scene that takes place in an English class where the three of them actually set up the vibe of their three-way relationship. So even while he's doing these things that seem absolutely goofy, uh, part of the thrill is you get a sense behind it that there's a controlling sensibility, that it's going to make sense one way or the other. You're going to feel it, even if you don't think it immediately. And yeah, uh, that's exactly. what I think that wonderful. Actually, Paul, just thinking about that, as an editor, I mean, uh, when you think how playful Godard is, I mean, does that just uh, kind of juice you up? <laughs> Well, yeah, it was, you know, when I rewatched the film, I was really struck. First of all, he uses the old Columbia logo with Lady Liberty, which, you know, anybody who's watched old movies is so familiar with. That's, that's the opening credit. And I think Columbia had even changed it at that point in 64. Uh, so he's using the old. So that is immediately shot cut to that crazy montage of the three faces, which is a bit of madness with that crazy jazz going on that, that Michel Legrand wrote for the opening. Um, so right off the bat, it's like this juxtaposition of the old with the new, really brand new. I mean, fast paced editing that's really assaultive. The music is assaultive. And then once the Band of Outsiders credit is over, he cuts to a street scene, the music cuts off, it's sound effects. So again, there's a shock cut of sound and slowly the camera pans with the traffic, which is completely different from the editing you've been seeing. And the title for Anna Karina comes up, which is really odd because it's, her name is on top, then it says actresses, and then the supporting actresses are underneath. Again, he's playing around with graphics in a way that nobody has done in, ever really. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, his playfulness, his, his uh, um, you know, wanting to do something that's brand new and different is, is apparent right off the bat in the credits. Yeah, I like the way you start talking about the old and the new because that's the French New Wave, uh, of course, yeah. the new is in the title, but part of it was resting on their rediscovery of what's old. I mean, they were uh, about uh, discovering personal directors, directors who they felt were auteurs, who left their imprint on the movie. And that involved them uh, resurrecting a lot of uh, American and European uh, movie history uh, yes. and, uh, and revolting against what they thought was the official history. So they would uh, not give, uh, you know, a lot of credit to someone like William Wyler, who was uh, Andre Bazin's big hero, uh, because mm -hmm. he was a huge studio filmmaker who made Academy Award winning movies. And similarly, just when people all over the world were embracing some of the French cinema of quality tradition movie makers like Henri-Georges Clouseau, um, they were saying, no, that's, that's not what's great. What's great is these guys who worked around the margins like John Vigo or uh, these really you know, strong personality directors like Jean Renoir who went off in all sorts of different directions. Yes. Uh, so they were kind of rewriting things, but you know, it's so funny when I just looked at that just now, I, I, it popped into my head. Uh, it, Claude Brasseur, who plays Arthur in this movie, um, 
who is sort of the uh, the more earthy uh, cruder of the of the two guys. Uh, he is the son of Pierre Brasseur, uh, mm -hmm. the great French actor who, of course, was in Children of Paradise. Uh, right. uh, probably the great French movie of all time, in my opinion, <laughs> new wave <laughs> or old wave. And, yes. uh, and you see him and he looks just like his dad. And uh, you see Sammy Fry and it's this, uh, he's this thin, elegant, uh, uh, stylized kind of presence. And it just reminded me, I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure Godard didn't write dithrams about how great Children of Paradise was, but looking at that casting, <laughs> I have to think somewhere in his mind, he was thinking Pierre Brasseur and Jean-Louis Barreau from Children of Paradise uh, yeah, surrounding yeah. this woman who they both love. And, uh, right. and I, I just love that about this movie is that uh, it has uh, all these references, but they're, uh, they're organic. So you still feel the joy that Godard probably had uh, in, his, uh, in his heart when he was kind of making this and putting all these things in. Yeah, absolutely. Michael, one thing we talked about uh, a little earlier in the week too was uh, you were thinking about the, the French New Wave as a kind of youth movement in a way. Mm -hmm. and, and Godard himself talked about, um, you know, that the French, you know, the, the French film industry was a bit open to newcomer filmmakers. So that that was part of the impetus for the French New Wave, these young, uh, ambitious uh, directors trying to make their headway and trying to do something completely new in reaction to a kind of conventional old traditional um, uh, French style of filmmaking. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, I was rereading uh, Truffaut's uh, The Films of My Life uh, uh, just before we went on. And I, and I actually think one of the things that's uh, remarkable about this movement and, and how it inspired similar movements in countries all over, I mean, everywhere, uh, anywhere there was a cinema, there was a new wave, um, mm -hmm. was that um, it, it wasn't so much that uh, their objection to the films made by the older directors uh, wasn't so much that they um, uh, were applying a certain craft that they, uh, a style that they didn't like, although that was part of it. It was yeah. that they dared to talk about the generation, their generation, the younger generation, mm -hmm. in ways that Truffaut and Godard and their peers didn't think was authentic. Uh, so, for example, Clouseau has a huge hit with a film called La Verite, which is actually a very interesting film with Bridget Bardot and Sammy Fry. But uh -huh. they don't think it speaks to them. And that's the main uh, source of, of, I think, the emotional anim <laughs> animus they had against the older directors is that they're appropriating their generation. These guys want to speak for themselves. Right, exactly. Uh, I mean, especially when you see how Truffaut, and he becomes a classical filmmaker. Uh, yes. You know, you see that um, a lot of this is just really a natural youthful rebellion. And that in, in France, where cinema is, you know, held in a, with a reverence that it is in probably no other country, uh, this has the impact of, uh, say, the Beatles had in pop music and rock music everywhere else. I mean, I yeah, really, do, right. I mm. really do think that um, uh, Godard and Truffaut are kind of the Lennon and McCartney. Uh, of, of movie making uh, in, in, in many ways. I mean, both in the, in the way they often teamed up. I mean, Truffaut uh, gave Godard the news story that was the basis of Breathless. He recommended uh, the novel that became Band of Outsiders, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but also in kind of their different styles. Godard is very uh, satirical. Uh, and, and apart from Band of Outsiders, he's not very emotional. He's very aggressive. Uh, right. Uh, Truffaut is emotionally expansive, uh, and he is very much about bringing all sorts of people in. Godard is really about uh, this integrity uh, and about uh, you know doing things that no one else has ever done consistently. That, uh, yes. that he's, he's he's not going to stand still. He's going to try something new each time. Uh, so uh, it, it really is a sense of uh, this balance between the two. And, and I think when they fall apart, when their friendship, uh, when they become distant, the new wave really falls apart. But yeah. we should also say that the new wave is, went beyond these guys. It went beyond Cahiers de Cinema. Uh, mm -hmm. When Truffaut would write about the new wave in later years, he'd include all these people who weren't really part of the new wave. Uh, the more intellectual filmmakers like Alan René, uh, who were you know, filmmakers who were considered left bank filmmakers, uh, Agnes yes. Varda. Uh, people who were uh, friends with people in uh, uh, French literary arts, uh, Marguerite Duras and Alain Robbrier, uh, as well as these amazing commercial filmmakers that uh, France had at that time. Uh, they embraced Roger Vadim, 
uh, mm -hmm. for And God Created Woman, the movie that uh, cast a new light on female sexuality with the help of its star, Bridget Bardot. And Louis Malle, who did something similar to Jean Moreau in The Lovers and just became yes. one of the most brilliant filmmakers of all time and the most versatile. Uh, yeah. And someone who showed that you could uh, do an, a, a, a career based on craftsmanship in a way and still be as adventurous and exciting as, as anybody else. So all those different kinds of people eventually, in retrospect, became part of the new wave. Uh, and uh, and, and it, it, it left uh, an example for American filmmakers when, uh, you know, for, for Coppola and Scorsese and mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hal Ashby. I mean, uh, everyone was aware of what they were doing or in Britain, uh, uh, Tony Richardson and Carl Rice and Lindsay Anderson. Yes. Uh, yep. And in uh, Germany, uh, Volker Schmondorf actually worked with many of these people and, you know, went on to make the tin drum. Uh, and in Japan, uh, Oshima and so many others. Uh, mm -hmm. So it really became uh, a, an international movement. And, uh, but here in Band of Outsiders, I think what we see is one of the uh, moments when everything came together uh, in a very organic and to me very lovely, beautiful, uh, uh, touching way. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, Jason, are you still there? Uh, I am. And do you want another clip? We're ready um, for it. Uh, I'm just wondering, were you able to get anything off the extras or no? I have a different Anna um, interview piece from the same interview, but not the one you requested. Okay, well, uh, let's skip it then because that's it's not going to work, I don't think, right? Okay, but well, we have the okay. second we have the second clip from the film ready to go if you want to do that. Okay, Be before we do that clip though, could I just make a, a quick thing about the the, the origins of, of Band of Outsiders a little bit? Yeah, um, I I, ju I just wanted to say that you know, in 1963, Godard, who had made a huge splash in in world cinema with Breathless, uh, which was an, an enormous international hit. Um, you know, it, it, it allowed him basically to, to, to uh, give him kind of carte blanche uh, to continue to make films. And between Breathless and Band of Outsiders in 64, he made six more films, which is a pretty amazing outfit in a very short amount of time from 60 to 64. It's quite extraordinary. Um, but I have to say each of the films was less well received, uh, less critically acclaimed, less successful at the box office. Uh, and they included films like A Woman is a Woman, Viva Spi, Le Carabiniers, which was a big flop. Um, and at that point, um, he started scrambling. Um, he just couldn't raise money anymore. And so he had this uh, idea that, um, you know, maybe what I need to do is to simplify my films. They're getting too confusing. They're getting too obscure. I just want to make a film about a girl and a gun. And Truffaut had introduced him to this novel called Fool's Gold, which had a basic... A uh, thriller plot, a basic robbery plot involving two men and a girl. And uh, he thought, okay, this can be my plot line. And so what he did is he wrote letters to all of the American film companies to say, give me $100,000 and I can make a film for you. And all of them, one of them came back to him and say, you know, uh, Mr. Godard, you know, $100,000 is an awful lot of money to ask uh, as a fee for a film director. And Godard went back to this guy at Columbia and said, no, 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 it's not for me, it's for the entire film. <laughs> so, you know, 100 grand in 64 is, is even then is, is chump change for a Hollywood production company. And so Columbia bought it and they said, okay, we'll give you the 100 grand. And they gave him a green light to go ahead and, and do an adaptation of Fool's Gold. Of course, what he did with Fool's Gold was to make it completely into his own. Um, you know, he wrote kind of a, 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 a phony script that he submitted to Columbia, which was more traditional, uh, which did follow the, the plot outlines of the robbery heist thing. Uh, but then, you know, he just sort of threw that out the window and just made what became much more of a, a kind of a love story. He was much more interested in the love triangle between Arthur... Um, uh, Arthur and Odile and, and uh, oh my God, I'm <laughs> France, yes. <laughs> and so we just used the robbery as a kind of a hook to, to bring this love story along. Um, and he, he really wanted to also just throw in all these wonderful, playful uh, allusions and, and uh, references that, you know, from all these movies that he loved and from literature that he loved. And so it's a very untraditional take on a, a robbery heist movie, for sure. Yeah, I'd like to uh, say fact, a few words about, the, about <laughs> Fool's okay. Gold. Just, just a minute. Just, I mean, I want to speak up for Fool's Gold, which is just that um, it actually is not a negligible book. I mean, it actually yeah. 
Uh, it, it was just collected a couple of years ago in, in this great collection by the Library of America called Women Crime Writers. And in fact, anything that has to do with plot and even the general outline of the characters is contained mm -hmm. in the book. Uh, it's just the texture, uh, as, as Paul is saying, is, is completely different. Right. Uh, and anything that, uh, that uh, speaks to the mechanics of suspense and how you're supposed to draw it out and build it up, uh, it, that's all gone. <laughs> right. And a lot of the actual how, how the crime is committed, what the money is, uh, you know, uh, what's the underlying crime, uh, all of that is, is sort of thrown out. And yet it's still, it, it's not as if he just took this book and, 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 and burned it. You know, he actually, uh, it gave him a spine that a lot of his movies yeah. don't have. Uh, yeah. And so I think this was uh, what, what Godard needed at that time was something that would give him a through line uh, and a sort of, uh, and a rooting interest. Because in fact, the, uh, the, the key that was, the thing that was different about Fool's Gold from other uh, novels that were in the Doubleday Crime Club, which is where it appeared, uh, is that it starts out as a juvenile delinquent book about these sort of guys, maybe they're 19, maybe they're 20 something, you know, and the money in the house and the girl. Uh, but then when they introduce the idea of the uncle of the guy who connects to an older generation of, uh, of uh, real thugs, um, and then your rooting interest changes, and then it becomes a generational thing, and you actually start to feel something for uh, these guys who are in over their heads and the girl who is like out of love going along with them. So that was an interesting uh, twist for this book, and that's the one that I think, as Paul indicated, that, that Paul Godard really seized on, uh, making this film about youthful dreamers uh, and, and doing it with a texture that's true to his own uh, experience uh, of uh, maybe not playing out Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, but playing out movie scenes with Truffaut and their gang as they're traipsing all over Paris going to the films. Yeah, no, exactly, yeah. I think let's, let's go to the next clip then. Um, uh, Jason, can we go to the next clip from Band of Outsiders, the classroom scene? And um, folks, just so you know, we might, Michael and I might talk over this a little bit as it's going along. Uh, so, Jason, if you could lower the audio on the clip just a hair. I, I particularly love this scene, uh, especially because uh, the teacher is reading passages from Romeo and Juliet, which again plays into the love story, um, you know, this rivalry between Franz. Mille fois plus sombre le soir qui perd l'éclat de ta And between Arthur. And this, this little scene in the classroom when Arthur starts to write notes to Odile is, I think, a great moment in the film. Des écoliers qui sortent de l'école. Mais l'amour quitte l'amour avec l'air affligé des écoliers qui reviennent à l'école. Des écoliers... <laughs> Odile grabs it from the guy. And again, Arthur, you know, has the presence of mind to take off on Shakespeare and say to be or not to be. <laughs> well, that, that's one difference between the characters Dans la belle in the Vérone, film and, and in the Pulp novel. They actually uh, have some uh, experience of Shakespeare. Par les <laughs> even quote it but in that way. Right. Le cours inquiet de leurs amours I love how Godard shot, shot the close-ups of his actors here um, sera and the interplay de of them looking at each other during this moment. De notre spectacle. Le motif de notre spectacle. And after his first note, you know, which is basically a little love note, now he's Romeo. criticizing Odile and saying your hair is too old fast. And that's a part of Arthur's character, you know, that, you know, as much as he's attracted to Odile, he has this thing within himself where in order to seduce this woman, he has to criticize it. Et plus inconstante que le vent qui caresse en ce moment le sein glacé du nord. Pour this se retourner close up in particular is so beautiful of Anna Karina, I think. A slightly high angle looking down that really features her eyes in such a beautiful way. Emperlée and a, a, I, I think a hallmark of Karina's performance too is her ability I mean, she was in her early 20s at that point, but she really does feel like a teenage girl, Juliette. who's very insecure 
Mon esprit appréhende certains développements, encore suspendus à l'influence des astres, mais qui risquent de prendre son origine amère et redoutable dans les réjouissances de cette soirée. Et de marquer le terme d'une vie méprisée, enclose dans ma poitrine, par l'injustifiant d'une mort prématurée. L'injustifiant d'une mort You can see how Franz is so disappointed because she's responding to Arthur and she goes ahead and changes her hair. And I love this bit of art direction with the little, little girl's mirror that Odile uses. Bonjour. I think uh, can we cut the uh, video now. Okay, we can stop there. Yeah. Yeah. Jason, yeah. The, uh, the, uh, the idea is also, uh, you know, Godard wants to give you as much at every second as he can. And uh, I think it's not, it's you're being asked to take in the, um, uh, the visual connections of those, of those close-ups. And uh, I love the way he isolates each person so that mm -hmm. uh, once he sets the geography of the room, uh, he yes. goes in and he stays in and you're sort of into their connections. It's, uh, uh, but also, as Paul was saying, it's the, um, uh, it's the, connection between the words and those images uh, and and the layers of the words I mean that you have the Shakespeare going on in the background and you have uh, you know Romeo talking about love drawing to love uh, and uh, uh, schoolboys from their books you know and and it, and it both evokes this kind of odd uh, post adolescent adolescent atmosphere where you have these like 20 something actors uh, and they're acting really like school kids. I mean, they're not like uh, the guys at a, at a night school in, the, uh, in, a, in a kitchen sink drama. You know, they're passing <laughs> notes, they're giggling. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's really quite a special atmosphere he creates. And, uh, and I think that's the key to the movie is he's using all these ordinary materials. I mean, the real locations um, kind of uh, to, uh, to create a kind of everyday reverie, uh, something, uh, uh, you see everyday reality transformed. And, uh, and I think he's doing that with the language. He's doing it with the images. Uh, and I think once you lock into that, you don't leave it. I mean, the, uh, Karina's whole character is really, uh, Odile, is really stylized. I mean, in the book, uh, someone remarks that she's almost as stunted, uh, she's as, uh, almost like a stunted 12-year-old, which is <laughs> a mean and gross uh, interpretation. Uh, in, uh, in, when Karina and Godard worked on it, they, she really decided this would be a naive character, uh, that this would be a, a girl who's out of it, who's not in any kind of uh, uh, rapport with people of her age, the way at least uh, Arthur and France have each other. Uh, so this is all new to her, and she's and it's her earnestness and her uh, emotionality that I think uh, kind of anchors the movie and makes it powerful. Uh, yes. She has a kind of uh, I like to think of it as like contact emotion. You know, she <laughs> she goes from Arthur to Franz and back again, and she feels things for both of them in different ways, and she feels them deeply at the moment. And you're yes. taken with her, and it's uh, and I think that's not a sign of her shallowness. I think it's a sign of that kind of weird adolescent, post-adolescent time that they're in, uh, where people are still finding out who they are and what their place are in the world. And I think that's what kind of um, uh, is, uh, you know, universal and sort of profound about this movie, even though it's a movie that, uh, you know, eschews any kind of outward sign of being, you know, important or profound. Right, right. I think it was one critic who wrote that um, reality becomes poetry in this film and, and poetry becomes reality. Uh, in terms of the style that, that Kadar is trying to create and the atmosphere he's trying to create throughout this entire film. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think that statement is really quite true. Yeah. Um, you you know, at, the beginning, show... at the beginning of that school scene, I mean, I, I assume everybody has watched it so they, they can uh, yes, they get have. back on it. I mean, uh, when you think about the whole setup, I just love uh, seeing at this time where, it, you know, they're going into an English class and yet it's like set up like uh, it's like they're going into studio 54 i mean there's like a bouncer at the you know yeah. at the at the run he's asking for a ticket you know and they devised arthur and franz have figured out the way of both getting them in, both getting in even though uh, franz is the only one who who had a ticket you know and uh, uh it's very funny it's uh it's sort of uh uh the godard setting up 
what his values are, making his values seem kind of sexy and glamorous in a movie way. Uh, yeah. And I think that's part of what this do. I mean, a lot of people used to criticize him at the time for his frame of reference being totally movie oriented. But this mm -hmm. film is full of literature, not just the Shakespeare. Uh, he, yes. he refers to Poe uh, later on uh, when he uh, describes a plot of the Pourloin letter, of, of a letter of, of something stolen being left right out in plain sight. Uh, and uh, one of the key, talking about reality and, uh, and fantasy, one of the key lines uh, comes when they dance the Madison, which we'll see when yeah. the narrator says France uh, doesn't know if uh, uh, you know, the world is becoming a dream or a dream is becoming the world. And, yes. and that's like a direct quote from Edgar Allan Poe's, uh, all we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. So uh, it's, it's full of uh, not just movie references, but literary references and, and references to the world at, at large when they read a paper and talk about the Rwandan genocide going on yes. back then. So uh, it's just incredibly rich. Yeah, it is. Let's take a look at the next clip. This is the clip where um, Odile goes to meet Arthur and Franz uh, just before they uh, go to the cafe to plan the, the heist. Uh, there's a whole number of things to uh, point out in, in this sequence. So let's run it and, and um, myself and Michael can talk over it a little bit. Jason, can we see the next one? Two things right here, in terms of Legrand's music, this music is a mixture of jazz and melodic score. And here he uses the jazz beautifully to accompany Odile's run. And Karina is just wonderful. I mean, her whole movements throughout this thing are just are spectacular. Again, the youthfulness, the teenager quality. Um, when Karina was making the movie, she loved that Bodar picked this location where you had to cross on the rowboats to get from the highway over to the house. She loved doing those scenes. She thought they were so wonderful. And you notice how the music just cuts off. Hi. It doesn't continue. How did she say there was money? Elle m'a dit un énorme tas, je pense, 40 ans. Elle commence à climber le banc. Elle appelle pour Franz et pas pour Arthur, même si elle est plus intéressée. Pourquoi je me demande pourquoi elle me dit ça Elle est un peu malade, cette fille. Pourquoi vous appelez Franz et pas moi Oui, c'est complètement faux. Ils sont idiots, mais Franz et moi, nous sommes idiots. Arthur, on va accompagner jusqu'à la scène, on va se faire prendre, on va prendre le métro. C'est une bonne idée. On va s'installer dans un café et faire un plan. Un plan Pourquoi Je l'aime quand elle fait ça. Arthur dit qu'il faut faire un plan et elle regarde la caméra et dit Mais pourquoi Pourquoi Encore, c'est partie de sa playfulness, où il vous fait vous rendre compte que le film est fait. Et maintenant, il vient en tant que narrateur. Um, in this beautiful passage, uh, and this narration was actually written after they shot the film. Arthur regarded always de cette façon, un peu comme si elle était une ombre à travers laquelle il eût voulu voir, comme si le jeune homme et la jeune fille eussent déjà été séparés par un océan d'indifférence. You know the um, uh, and now the melodic score comes in. Also the heading of this, uh, you know, the wire factory. I mean, it's, uh, I think we could probably, you want to go longer on this? Or we can, uh, okay. Yeah, we can, we can stop. You want to stop? Yeah, let's stop. I mean, what's so interesting about this setting is that um, it's an industrialized part of Paris. It's, and it's Join, uh, Joinville Le Pont or something like that. Yes. And, um, uh, the, uh, at one point, one of them says, are we still in Paris? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's interesting because it is, a, 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 the whole movie is showing you parts of Paris, uh, a lot that you don't know and a lot that you do know. The bulk of the action is this, these things, places where you don't know. And yes. there's a sort of sense of, um, uh, again, it's a decrepit kind of industrial setting. It probably was booming in the late 19th century, which is when in industry came to that area. Mm -hmm. And who knows, maybe that crazy house is, uh, uh, maybe it was a, a kind of robber baron's house at the time. I mean, it's big enough and it's strange enough that, uh, you know, and, and the woman 
who uh, is uh, has sort of adopted Odile is, is has a peculiar enough relation to society. I mean, at one point she's going to the Albanian embassy for a party. <laughs> so you get this sense of uh, a kind of a weird world in transit. Um, uh, you know, an, an industrial thing, which again, you know, uh, France was not as advanced in, in that as, as England and America. So in a sense, there's more of the kind of uh, American influence there. And of these, uh, you know, the, the, this, these youths trying to kind of make their own sense out of, uh, you know, a world that really is in chaos. And I think that's, uh, I think one thing uh, that's great about Karina's performance and that drives it I think movie even more than the two guys who are great mm -hmm. uh, is is just how intrepid she is. I mean, how yes. uh, and and you were talking about her going up and down and you know and one she goes up two ladders, not just one ladder, two ladder, and later she yes. gets there. Uh, she's and I think the movie is a love letter to Karina in that way. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, Godard and Karina did not have like the most stable. In relationship in marriage. Uh, she uh, uh, had a miscarriage at one point. Uh, uh, there was infidelity. Um, she uh, she complained that Godard would go off for two or three weeks at a time and not tell her what he was doing. Uh, and he, Godard always needed to be working on a movie. And the idea and part of the reason he made so many movies with her was that was his way of, of staying with the partner was to make movies with them. Yes. Uh, but she, there she, and and the key conflict of their marriage and the conflict of a lot of the movies they made together is the conflict between a woman who is uh, emotional and instinctive and these guys who think they're very rational <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly. although, although, although that can be called into question uh, and so i think you know they were actually at a point of reconciliation when they made band of outside yes uh, which i think is a wonderful thing to think about because i think it's a movie where he really kind of celebrates her mm -hmm. uh, he really it, it, she really does provide an opening into this world that the two guys create uh, and lets you take it seriously in, until and, and and then you know be aghast by it too, and then sort of rebound from it. Uh, and I think uh, without her performance, uh, you wouldn't be able to do that. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, before we see the very next clip, let me just mention that you know Karina herself, um, you know she was movie mad herself. She was a, a young girl from Denmark actually who came to Paris and her intention was to get into the movie somehow. When she was a kid, she loved going to the movies and loved Ava Gardner movies and Hollywood musicals. Um, and, and in fact, one reason why uh, this next scene may have been planned is that Godard knew about her love of uh, American movie musicals. And uh, one of the great set pieces in, in Band of Outsiders is, is the dance called Madison, where the three characters dance in the cafe. So Jason, you wanna roll that clip and we'll take a look at that first. And, uh, it, it, it's sort of self-explanatory. I'm not sure if I'm going to talk over it because it's so wonderful. But Michael, if you have anything to say, you might want to chime in. <laughs> I like watching the clip. Okay. I love that Sammy puts the hat on her. Part of the charm of the scene is that they're obviously not trained dancers. But they've rehearsed very hard. They rehearsed constantly over a period of two weeks before they shot the scene. Well, this is not, this is known as the Madison, but it's not like any Madison anyone had ever seen <laughs> before or since. Um, and they do this kind of choreographed their bodies there but again it's not part of any like american line dance uh, that uh, you know was danced at the time but that's part of i think moment of une deuxième parenthèse kind of charming and de les sentiments des personnages yes and um, how, how he cuts out the music so he can do these little narrations yeah. so this is actually what he loved about the novel he said it's the way the narrative uh, come in and out Arthur uh, regarde sans arrêt ses pieds, mais il pense à la bouche de Dill, uh, à ses baisers. Dans ce cas, c'est Godard, totalement Godard. Quand on a vu le dernier film, on a vu le dernier film, on a vu le dernier film, on a vu le dernier film. I love the way Brasseur is just looking at his feet. Yes. <laughs> Odile se demande si les deux garçons remarquaient ces deux seins qui remuent à chaque pas sous son chandail. And 
there's a real blessing. I mean, the Il ne sait pas si c'est le monde qui est en train de devenir rêve ou le rêve du monde. Well, the other thing is that it's a scene where uh, they're in a group and yet they are totally, they're not really looking at each other. Uh, right. It's all like an individual thing. I mean, you kind of sense uh, Karina's rhythm kind of driving it and holding mm -hmm. it together. She's uh, the best dancer. Then, yeah, she's the best dancer, obviously. But she, uh, but on the other hand, Fry, I mean, he has that thing where he's giving it his all. It's like a routine he's practiced and he's going to mm -hmm. sell it. Whereas right. Brasseur, true to his character, is kind of like trying to be offhand. And as the scene goes on, of course, Bresser is the first one that splits off. Uh, you know, then Frey kind of stops as if, uh, oh, I've had enough. I've done my thing. And yeah. Karina keeps, keeps, keeps going. going. And she's <laughs> driving that dance the way she's driven the rest of the movie. And just the staging, you know, at certain points, you know, at the beginning, that guy drops in and, and, and there's that weird joke that apparently is from a, a French furniture advertisement at the time that Frey yeah. says in Mr. Segalo. Uh, and at the end, there's a kind of waiter uh, coming in and out and there when you see the whole thing you really see that uh, you know Gadar has staged this like musical number as if it's something you could actually see happening in a cafe uh, yes. so it's that combination of things that he's doing throughout this movie that's uh, that's that's really something and and then you see kind of Karina coming into her own in a way Odile is coming into her own she's so relaxed there in a way she mm -hmm. isn't you know when she's just with the guys on their own turf and uh and, and I think that's part of her growth as a character I think that you know she's been with Arthur I mean she's attracted to Arthur she's uh, initially I think and and I think this is an archetypal thing uh that uh, you know he's the earther earthier coarser stronger he's the one uh who will make a move and that's what she likes about him you know, yes. uh, and and that may be part of her initiation that's necessary into you know, her romantic life. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the next time we see her with uh, Sammy Fry, uh, with, with Franz, who's uh, much more stylized and poetic. He's doing gestures with his hands all the time. He really is almost like a mime, like a Jean-Louis Barreau character. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he talks about her having imagination. Uh, and it's when he talks about uh, that she has the imagination to make up an ex excuse if she's left behind after the job, that, oh, there were prowlers or something, uh, that she, that opens something up for her. She realizes, yes, she does have an imagination. <laughs> and, and that's sort of what seals them. It's like uh, she becomes part of Franz's dream. And, and in a way, yes. in a weird way, the movie shifts. So that instead of this dual dream, it ultimately becomes Franz's dream and then Franz's and, and Odile's dream. And of course, ultimately, ultimately, it's Godard's dream. Yes. I'm just lucky to be a part of it. Right. Um, uh, the, the next clip uh, that we're showing, this is actually one of Michael and my favorite scenes in the whole film. Uh, it takes place on the subway where she's riding alone with Arthur uh, and they've just spent more time together. Uh, and again, she begins to realize something different about Arthur in that scene uh, when she talks about the possibility of marriage and he kind of uh, is very off-putting about it. Uh, but at that moment in the subway, um, it reminds her of something and she begins to sing this beautiful song. Um, can we, can we sing, uh, show this clip now, uh, Jason, and we can talk about this song? The song, by the way, is from uh, Louis Aragon. You see how he's not very happy about that comment? <laughs> Ses données, ses seins et ses jambes. She's so vulnerable in this scene. 
one of the biggest pies in movies. Just amazing. And this is that idea that you can shift how you think about someone by the context you put in the burial. Il ramène dans son carton un ours en peluche pour sa petite fille malade. Il aura l'air d'un brave type. Au contraire, vous trouverez qu'il a une sale gueule. Si vous pensez qu'il y a du plastique dans son carton pour faire sauter la République. Here's the cool shot moment. Yeah. This is both a statement on life and a statement on editing. Comment c'était J'en ai tant vu qui s'en allait. Il ne demandait que du feu. Il se contentait de si peu. Apparence brisée, vous regardez m'arrache l'âme. Les choses vont comme elles vont. De temps en temps, la terre tremble. Que malheur, que malheur au sang. Il est profond, profond, profond. Ce ciel de croix, je le connais, ce sentiment. J'y crois aussi moi par moment. J'y crois parfois, je vous l'avoue, à non plus croire mes oreilles. Quand oh, je suis bien mm. votre pareil, oh, je suis bien pareil à vous. She gets both the ah, anchor and the pathos of that. I mean, it's, it's a poignant song, and it's, it's, she's expressing their solidarity with the, the people who are you know, like Warren Stone. Uh, and yet, she's the character. You can stop the clip, Jason. But, you know, she has such incredible potency when she looks at the camera like that and with the yes. moment of fierceness. And it lifts it out of sentimentality, I think. It, mm -hmm. And it reminds you that. She's a, a girl who's going to be in the, the robbery we're, we're about to see. She's, you know, going to be upset and uh, at loose ends. But in a way, she is a, a person who would have a banal life like that. Uh, but she's not going to because mm -hmm. of this, uh, you know, crazy crime that she's gotten herself involved in. So it's both a wonderful moment in itself. And, uh, uh, and I think as a, a use of a song in a film, it's like Jean Moreau's song in the middle of, uh, Jules and Jim. It kind of tells you something about the un emotional underpinnings of these characters and and the real underpinnings of these characters. Uh, that there is this sense of uh, you know despair and trying to lift yourself up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and, uh, and but done with such uh, poetry uh, that it's not a you know it's not a message uh, uh, about the homeless or anything. Although that is part of it. Yes, no, exactly. I know. It's interesting that the, the final close-up that Godard uses, I, I noticed that it's slightly out of focus. Uh, in the rest of the film, it's, it, the focus is very sharp. Um, and then at one close-up, it's, it's rather sharp, uh, soft. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wondered if Godard shot it that way or if uh, the cameraman actually made a mistake, but it was Karina's best take of singing mm -hmm. it. Um, I'm, certainly her emotion in that shot is just extraordinary. And they may have decided to keep the out of focus shot because it was the best take of her performance. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious about it, but it is, again, that close up is so luminous of her. It's, it's hard to take your eyes off her. It is a famous moment that uh, people like to refer to in the partnership of Godard and Karina, where in uh, Viva Sa Vie, uh, My Life to Live, she's uh, watching Falconetti in uh, The Passion of Joan of Arc, uh, mm -hmm. the great Dreyer, Dreyer uh, movie. and. Uh, and, and her face is echoing the emotions of Falconetti. I actually think the close-ups in the song are, are really her Falconetti, Falconetti moment. I think she has such a, a, a formidable kind of response to what she is singing herself. Exactly. <laughs> uh, that it is, uh, you know, it, it's just an amazing moment. It's like that moment in a way, part of the thing that's, the, the other thing we showed where they're talking about a plan and she says, why, what, why a plan? Um, <laughs> is when she breaks out of the uh, convention of the movie, 
you see this incredible uh, vitality of her. I mean, yes. it, not just uh, as a as an actress, but just as a person. You know, <laughs> and uh, I think that's part of the the, the greatness of Godard's method at that time was his way of merging. Uh, everything about the players, uh, not just their technique uh, and their star personality, but the, you know something of their essence. And he did that uh, very deliberately. You know, he would not show them uh, the actual script pages until very shortly before they shot. You yes. know, he would try to shoot very quickly. I mean, people think um, uh, that shooting rapidly and uh, was a sort of uh, just to give it a kind of verite flavor. But in fact, you know, when you're working with actors. Um, the time you take to set up lights in intricate ways, that just saps the energy out of everybody. Yes. Yeah, you know, working as light on his feet as Godard did with Ralph Kutar, the cinematographer, um, you know, he could keep the energy up. You know, he could keep driving them uh, and, and let them turn off that kind of conscious thing which could uh, some way get in the way of their performance. And, and in a way, they do become you know, both themselves, even more themselves as they're becoming figures in his own reverie, which I think is you know, the magic of a great director. I mean, I don't know how you explain it. No, absolutely. I agree with you totally. Uh, Karina would talk about that. She, uh, she talked about working with Godard as opposed to other directors and the fact that he would not give them script pages with dialogue until the, the morning of the shoot. Um, and she actually liked that because it didn't give her time to think too hard about the character or to question uh, what, the, what the motivations were, to question what the dialogue was meaning in anything. Um, and, and as soon as he gave them the script pages to, to memorize, he would go immediately into blocking them, really controlling their movements and, and how they moved uh, within the scene that he was about to shoot. Yeah. Um, and, and, and she yet, thought that was part of his brilliance uh, because she felt like it did allow her to remain somewhat spontaneous uh, and kind of in the moment because uh, she had just gotten the dialogue with that kind of immediacy and the movement with that kind of immediacy, and then she could just hop right into it uh, uh, with, a, with a great kind of spontaneity. Uh, and she deeply admired him for that. Yeah. Um, you and know, I think and, one of the inter interesting thing is when it comes to the tactile materials that Nactor uses, he was very collaborative. I mean, in terms of uh, their, their costuming, you know, yes. uh, the, uh, and that she wears these tan schoolgirl skirts and sweaters and <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, that is actually the, 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 the more I've learned about the uh, kind of dramatic features, especially, I mean, that is so crucial to people. I mean, it's wh whether you're making, uh, you know, a, a romance, uh, a, hard, a sort of weird hard world romance like Band of Outsiders or, you know, a Western like uh, The Magnificent Seven, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, you, you, getting the actors involved in their costuming. Uh, getting them to see themselves uh, not just at home in this kind of second skin, but also having a visual sense the way you have a visual sense of yourself just as a person. Yes. Uh, it's uh, just dynamite. I mean, the directors who do that just get amazing, amazing results. Yeah. And Karina talked about how collaborative that was with Godard. Uh, because when they first started the film and they talked about the character of Odile, um, they thought, you know, she should be rather naive and very vulnerable. And, and the ideas for the pigtail hair, hairdo that Odile wears at the beginning was, was Karina's idea. Uh, and also the suggestion for the kind of schoolgirl pleated skirts that she wears. Um, so she was, again, uh, uh, very instrumental in, in, in creating the character through the costuming and the hair, and the hair design, um, working very closely with Godard on those choices. Uh, and again, she really admired the fact that, she, that he allowed her those kinds of, uh, 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 that, that kind of collaboration between the two of them and creating the character. And in terms of costuming, of course, the guys the same way. I mean, uh, uh, Franz's hat and his yeah. uh, sport jackets, as opposed to uh, uh, you know Arthur's, Arthur's sweater, wool cap, and his, uh, his sweater. I mean, it's uh, uh, it's a whole different ballgame with that. And the hat, of course, becomes this um, huge signal to the audience of what's happening with the characters. I mean, at the beginning, right. uh, uh, when she's more interested in Arthur. Uh, you know, she sort of takes uh, Franz's hat playfully when they're sitting in the car and Franz almost immediately puts it back <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, but then kind of, uh, then she wears it during the Madison. Uh, I mean, it's a very, uh, you can track a lot of things by what's happening with, uh, with the characters' uh, costumes. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, let's, and let's not forget the stockings. I mean, the... Uh, oh that, my God. That actually is a, an element of the novel too, uh, the wearing of the stockings as the... Um, uh, as the masks, but it it does have this, you know, huge, unsettling, erotic, scary side to it. 
Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and again, it's nothing much is underlined, although at one point we see Arthur sniff his stocking, which is uh, <laughs> true to Arthur. Uh, true to Arthur, yes. But it does give you a, a different um, uh, a, a sense that they're in this dangerous, odd, spooky territory. Yeah, it's true, yeah. Um, we don't have a clip from the robbery itself, but um, Michael and I uh, admire the ending a great deal. So that, that's the next clip we have. Do you want to put that up, Jason, and then we could uh, talk about it as we play or right afterwards? Toi, vous, lui, eux, votre, notre, leur. She plays this childish game to decide if they're going to go north or south, if you remember. Trois jours après, en ouvrant les yeux, Odile et Franz aperçurent la mer. Elle ressemblait à un théâtre, le théâtre, dont la scène se situe exactement à l'horizon. Au-delà, il n'y a plus que le ciel. Devant cette harmonie qui se propageait doucement en vastes ondes, Franz et Odile n'aperçurent tout à coup ni limite ni contradiction. Est-ce qu'il y a des lions au Brésil Oui, et aussi des crocs, Odile. Pensez à moi. Évidemment, oui. De quelle façon C'est la même façon que vous à moi. I love her sailor's Quand cap. les garçons pensent yeah. au ski, Not a boat. <laughs> ils pensent à leurs yeux, à leurs jambes, à leur poitrine. Les filles pensent aux garçons exactement de la même manière. <laughs> Donc on s'aime. On va bien voir. <laughs> and here's the toy. If you remember, they were playing with the toy in the cafe before they did the Madison. So it reappears here at the end. Mettez votre main autour de la boule. See and here it works for Franz. And in the cafe, it didn't work for Arthur, if you remember. Mon histoire finit là, comme dans un roman bon marché. À cet instant superbe de l'existence où rien ne décline, rien ne dégrade, rien ne déchoit. Et c'est dans un prochain film que l'on vous racontera, en cinémascope et technicolore cette fois, les nouvelles aventures de Dill et de Franz dans les pays chauds. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you I, love, I love the scene in the car right before. I mean, um, I don't know if we got all of that, but it, it, it shows you how his Godard's mind is working. He actually brings it full circle from the scene in the Shakespeare class where Romeo is talking about uh, 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 his dreams being like winds to pierce the frozen bosom of the north or perhaps to go down to the, the dew-draped uh, south. Uh, and yes. it's, uh, once again, they're talking about kind of the north and the south. And of course, Franz was, um, you know, going to go north when he was going to be on his own. He says he was going to go north because, uh, you know, he loves old Jack London stories. And he tells this Jack London kind of tall tale. Uh, and now, but now that he's with um, uh, Odile, they're going south. <laughs> they're going to, <laughs> to a warm climate. And, and, uh, and there's something about that taboo which of course is a direct quotation from uh, Charlie Chaplin's The Immigrant uh, yes. that has a kind of almost like a musical comedy quality to it and part of it is that dog in the back I mean it's just the yes. perfect dog it's a terrier you think of the thin man and Aston and, and things like that right. um, and uh, and partly is this some slightly kind of posed uh, daguerreotype kind of image of the two of them nestled against each other um, mm -hmm. and I like that, and in, in, you know, we don't know really where they are at, at this point. I mean, uh, they've they've gotten away. We've had a little decompression where they process the tragedy, and they do have a moment where they process the tragedy. Uh, but they, uh, but they're out there on an adventure. The two of them, hopeful of the future, and she doesn't commit to being in love, which I think is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I love the way the. Um, uh, the narrator says, uh, you know, we're going to follow their adventures in the tropics and uh, cinemascope and technicolor. Uh, Godard did have this idea that if you made a black and white film at that time, you had to do it the academy ratio, the square ratio. Yes. Uh, and that if you did a technicolor film, you had to do a widescreen film. And of course, the, the, the next film that, that, that's probably one of the key films along with Band of Outsiders in the Karina Godard uh, Malager allegory of Godard's filmmaking is Piero Le Fou, right. uh, where unfortunately they go south, but um, it doesn't turn out well. <laughs> no. <laughs> and neither but it, isn't the, it isn't technicolor and cinemascope. Uh, right. So, uh, and neither did the marriage either. <laughs> right. 
But you know, when looking at that dog, I mean, it's kind of like um, it, it, it's almost like a, 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 he's like blessing the couple in a way. Yes. I mean, he's, and uh, but I love the way in this film again you you make these associations and uh, and it enriches the film. You know, whether you get it or not, there's that feeling to the film. There's this kind of fairy tale feeling to that ending. Yes. Um, and, and that he pulls it off after, um, you know, showing what is actually in many ways a kind of scary sequence of the robbery and the, the gagging of the woman and all that. I think it's interesting that in the book, uh, the woman actually is killed. And that's a huge part of the plot at that point. And the, there's a very, you know, uh, labored denouement, uh, but uh, that he throws away entirely. Uh, I think it's a really good that when Stoltz comes back in the uh, movie for his money, uh, we do see the woman in her white uh, uh, bathroom. Yeah, she's alive. She's alive. She's alive. I don't think this film could have been supported. I think it can support Arthur, Arthur's uh, kind of the Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid death yeah. and the death of the uh, the cousin who's trying to uh, horn in on the job. I think the movie can support that partly because uh, Arthur, it's part of his fantasy, really. He's fulfilling one of his fantasies. Uh, right. Uh, live fast, die young, leave a beautiful corpse. Uh, but, uh, you yeah, know, I don't think it would have supported the, the death of an innocent woman and, um, or more or less innocent woman. Uh, and, <laughs> and I think that helps build us to the, to the, to the ending, which, which I find really satisfying. Although I'm curious what the other people who watched the film thought about the ending. I mean, does anyone there want to join in? Uh, actually, can I just talk yeah, one sure. thing about the ending? Yeah. Um, just in reading about the film, I discovered that, uh, you know, Godard, what, he wanted to change the ending of the book for sure. He wasn't happy with how the book ended and wanted to change it, but couldn't quite come up with, you know, how to do it. And they, evidently they tried quite a few things that uh, nothing quite worked. And then he had this great idea about putting them on the ship going south and thought of Chaplin's The Immigrant and the look of that film, uh, you know, frame that shot. Uh, and he speaks about how it's actually one of his favorite shots in the entire movie, the composition on that, and then the dialogue that he wrote for it and bringing back the little toy that would prove whether Franz loves her or not. Um, and he loved the dog. <laughs> <laughs> so all that was deliberate on his part, and, and, and he was just so happy with how, you know, that decision uh, to end the film that way came about. Uh, ultimately, he thought it was a perfect way to, to close out the film. Um, and then going from the, the shot of the two of them to the shot of the ship on the ocean and then to the world itself, <laughs> spinning right. around, anticipating a sequel to the life of Franz and Odile. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really such a sweet and, 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 and wonderfully comic uh, ending to the film. Yeah, it's curious. I mean, uh, we haven't really done much q and I mean, Jason, can we connect to any of the people in the audience if they want to ask some questions or... I, I uh, just turned I, on everyone's videos and you can turn on, you can unmute yourself if there's... I mean, I, you, you can ask a question too, but if you just have a comment, because I know this is not the normal fair that we watch in this club. And, and, um, and, Paul, yeah, and, I, no, and Paul and I and Doris talked about it before and we said, um, yeah, I think everyone's going to get a kick out of it. And, uh, <laughs> and you guys have done such a beautiful job setting it up in terms of film history. It was really a revolutionary, you know, that whole period of time was so radical. So I'm curious to see how people, what they felt when they were, watched it and if they feel a little differently after the conversation. Anybody out there want to have a question or a comment or whatever? Nobody? <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> that's cool. Karen, are you, Karen's always game. Come on, Karen. Karen, you got something? She doesn't have a video. Yeah. Oh, do we have Karen's audio? Karen, Karen just texted to say her mic's not working, but she said it was a fabulous analysis of the film. So that's her answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We appreciate that, Karen. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Uh, I just have one, one quick question. If you could summarize the... Marisol. Yeah, that's me. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, if you could summarize the French New Wave elements in the film, because you, you did a great presentation about it, but if you haven't watched the 1950s, uh, First World War I, uh, and this is post-World War II, right? Yes. So basically, what would you say uh, are the elements? I mean, I think it- Stylistically? 
stylistically. Exactly. Can I start, Michael? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of it was is that they, they wanted to, to, to make movies out on the street. They wanted to make movies that uh, felt more real. They wanted to kind of abolish the whole studio look, uh, the rigidity uh, that was part of that convention of, of, of 1950s French filmmaking. Uh, it gave it more of a, a, a feeling of life, of, of, of liveliness. Um, the other thing was is that they wanted to play around with the editing and make the editing faster and use jump cuts and, and cut to odd things at, at various moments. Um, the use of the music, if you notice, uh, Godard is, he starts a piece of music in odd places and cuts it off. Instead of letting it run through a whole scene, it just ends at odd places. Um, uh, again, and, and, and also that kind of feeling of spontaneity. Um, this idea that Godard would give the, the actors the pages first thing in the morning um, and, and not over rehearse them and, and not let them think too hard about it uh, did create um, that kind of thing. Um, and, and also taking what was supposed to be a, 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 a movie that's a thriller, but then transforming it into a love story. Um, so that it, it, it's, you know, it, it defies the expectation of what the audience is, is expecting to see. Uh, and actually reaching down and getting into something that's much more interesting to this young director himself. Um, and the fact that Godard loved language, uh, you know, it, it just, he decided when he wrote the commentary, for example, to, you know, mine from various novelists and poets and steal things from them and, and writing the commentary um, that, that runs along throughout the entire film. Uh, again, it doesn't really pertain so much to the robbery itself as it does to the love story between the three actors. Can I, can um, I, can yeah, I Michael, do you want to, you want to jump in, Michael? Uh, yeah, I just want to say that I, I agree with, with everything you said. And, um, uh, and a part of this is of course, uh, a, a technical thing too, is that they've got lighter weight cameras. Uh, they, yes. Raoul Coutard w was a war photographer actually. And yeah. uh, so he was quick on his feet uh, and he uh, used lightweight equipment. And um, if it, instead of laying down tracks, they do anything to get a shot, they put the camera in a baby carriage and, mm -hmm. you know, and push it that way. So a lot of it is, uh, is, is pushing the technique uh, so that there's more, uh, that, that, so, so everybody be faster on their feet. Uh, but I think in terms of the overall kind of the more cosmic uh, thing about the essence of the new wave, uh, and I think you see it beautifully in this movie, uh, is the collision of tones, that they were mm -hmm. not going to make a movie that's uh, any one thing. Uh, so, uh, you know, a comic moment, a slapstick moment can be up against a very tender romantic moment. Um, there, there can be violence uh, and just goofiness. Uh, and, and it keeps the audience unsettled. And, um, and this is, I, I think, true of Truffaut's best movies, uh, yes. Chief Piano Player, Jules and Jim. I think it's true of uh, Godard's uh, best movies of this period, like Band of Outsiders and Breathless. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it actually threw, uh, it, it threw critics, but uh, among the younger generations everywhere, I think this is part of what made uh, the new wave take off. As they saw this mixture, this collision of emotion. And, it, and moods and true not just what they wanted from a movie but what what was their life was like you know, especially uh in the 60s uh and so uh, i think that to me is the most crucial thing and when you see the american renaissance as we like to think about it start happening i yeah. mean one of the big movies is bonnie and clyde which yes is, michael uh, right. which is the uh which is so connected to band of outsiders and yeah. the shoot the piano player and in fact um you know, the screenwriters wanted first Truffaut to do it. And it, I didn't realize until I was always doing some of the background reading for Band of Outsiders that Godard at one point was, um, uh, was attached to Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, yes. and, and, and of course, Bonnie and Clyde opens in America. And, and again, it has a huge youthful following. It's an enormous hit, but a lot of the uh, establishment critics, well, it's primarily Bosley Crowe at the New York Times, they just think it's uh, you know, so awful that, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're young, they're in love, they kill people. You know, that it's a romance <laughs> about these uh, people who kill people. And right. so uh, to me, that is like, um, you know, all the things that Paul said, and also just this, this embrace of colliding tones and, and moods and emotions. I think uh, uh, to me, that's the new wave. Is yeah, it, exactly. I, I, ju I just want to mention that, you know, you bring up Bonnie and Clyde and it's so true how influential this film was to Bonnie and Clyde, uh, but also to the editor, D.D. Allen on Bonnie and Clyde. 
she so deeply admired what the editors were doing on Truffaut and Godard's films, and she stole from them like crazy. Uh, and you can see her influence in the way in which she cut Hollywood uh, directors' films in the late 60s and early 70s, that all of that was coming from the French New Wave uh, and really changed the whole tonal quality uh, of American filmmaking, you know, in a, in a major way. Okay. There was, a, Paul, would it be safe to say that there was also a, um, a political element to this too, and, and Michael, that um, it seems like this whole movement was a, there was a kill your daddy element. <laughs> You know, oh, last night I watched, you know, I have a, I have a graduating senior, or non-graduating, graduating senior. Yeah. We, we watched the Obama speech last night and he said something to the effect, it's your tur turn to lead because it's very clear that the people are leading are doing a very terrible job of it. <laughs> and it seems like I, there was an irreverence, and actually irreverence is too weak of a word for these filmmakers, where they said um, the way it, the way we've been telling stories is um, not serving us. It's time to tell stories in different kinds of ways and to yeah. Yeah. turn them inside out. And of course, Godard went from Band of Outsiders to make really um, aggressively political anti- Yeah, he went through a whole agile prop. Yeah. You know. And yeah. so it seems like that whole, on a political angle, there was an element of radicalism and revolution um, even though this is a, a gentle kind of film, except for the, the, the burst of violence, it's a, there is a radicalism and a, um, and a rebirth seems to be happening in, in the French New Wave. Yeah, well, I think that in terms of politics, actually, at this point, um, when you look at what Godard says in his films, it really is a plague on both your houses uh, kind of attitude. Uh, it's not just left or right. Uh, and, uh, you know, in Masculine Feminine, um, which is where he uh, starts to develop his own form. And I think Masculine Feminine actually is maybe uh, that and Weekender is less, to me, really, really great films, um, where he starts to incorporate, in Masculine Feminine, he incorporates uh, documentary techniques and all that. Uh, and he's referring to the younger, younger generation as the children of Marx and Coca-Cola. And uh, <laughs> that's, I think, been misinterpreted as, uh, as you know, they're the, the Marx is one spouse and Coca-Cola is the other spouse or parent. Uh, but actually, I think what he's saying is that there are these two trademarked things that in the political world, there's Marx and there's Coca-Cola and there's capitalism, and neither of them are really providing the answers at, at that point. Uh, and I think that's a very healthy position for an artist not to be uh, branded with a certain uh, a political uh, statement. I think one of the reasons that early on, although I thought they were great talents, the, the British New Wave or, uh, or the British Free Cinema, as they called, was, was not as great uh, as the French New Wave was that they really were tied to a kind of predictable political program. Uh, I think there is a politics of discontent that's here. And, and that's one thing I was trying to bring up with kind of the industrial setting, uh, yeah. uh, that there is this sense of nothing's really, it's too bizarre, nothing's working. Uh, we don't even know this part of Paris exists, you know, where they have, uh, you know, wire factories and things like that. Uh, and we have, we've got to create something new. So I think that kind of discontent and that kind of, uh, you, you know, rebellion against uh, uh, things as they are. I mean, there's definitely po political content to it, but at this point in Gadar's career, I don't think it's become a political agenda yet. Uh, and, and I think that's really healthy <laughs> for an artist, you know. Uh, so, I mean, just much as, you know, much as the guys who made the, um, uh, the American Renaissance films like Coppola or Warren Beatty and, and Arthur Penn, um, they definitely were liberal left people. Uh, but, uh, you know, The Godfather is a movie uh, that is both, uh, and of course, when you take in the, the whole saga, and of course, it's the incredible uh, condemnation of, uh, of capitalism, and yet, um, you know, a, a budding capitalists quote all of Michael Corleone's and Vito Corleone's lines to each other <laughs> in the gym. Uh, so it's that kind of uh, richness of showing the panoply of life, I think, that, uh, uh, th that you get when, when artists have this kind of not settled um, attitude towards the world in front of them right right so is yeah. there are there any final thoughts from our club members anyone uh, have a last comment or impression of the film i just have to say it was a great presentation mm. thank you
Oh, thank you, Marisol. Paul and Michael. It was, oh. it was wonderful. Oh, well, thank you. It's fun to be with my old friend, Paul. This is what we used to do at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Hopefully the tech was smoother at lunch. <laughs> oh, it worked out fine, Jason. No problem. Yeah, no worries. It's fine. Thank we you. had some other treats to oh, show you, but oh, we Michael. just had some, we had some hiccups. Um, well, Michael, I, I especially, oh, yes. For me? This, it's an easy question. Uh, uh -huh. How did Columbia react to the bait and switch that Godard did with the money? Was there uh, any kind of uh, <laughs> blackback? <laughs> the, the, well, the film, well, it was so cheap that it wasn't, you know, it, w it wasn't a big uh, loss for them. And, uh, and they didn't put a lot of energy behind, you know, promoting it. I think it, it uh, astonishingly, it played uh, just as bad in Paris as it did in New York when it opened. Um, I think it was like a three days or a week in, in each place. Uh, and, but the, I don't know if we've talked about this, but I think one thing that's really uh, uh, nice about this as a, uh, just as a phenomenon, is it's one of those movies where it, very few people embraced it at the time. And, 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 and in fact, even Godard authorities, you know, uh, like my friend Richard Brody uh, from The New Yorker who wrote Godard's uh, 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 definitive biography, uh, because it's not a typical Godard film, because it actually is much more like a Truffaut film. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even now, some of those people don't really uh, give it a lot of credit. I mean, Pauline Kael was one of the few who did. Yeah. But it is a, such a beguiling movie if you give yourself to it uh, and that it has become a beloved movie in spite of everything, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in spite of the, the boredom of the distributors and the uh, uh, dismissive notices of the critics. Uh, it's somehow been handed down. I, I think it's more popular now uh, than it ever was. And one, one thing actually that's, that's fun that um, uh, Paul and I were talking about earlier in the week was that you know, Pauline Kael did write a wonder, it's one of her best reviews and it's in all oh, her, it's fantastic. It's in uh, Kiss, Kiss Bang Bang, but it's also in the two compendium collections that she has. And um, uh, she has lines in it where she talks about uh, this being uh, as if, uh, you know, into the French intellectuals at an espresso bar, you know, uh, dreamed up uh, a gangster movie, this is what it would be like. And uh, Quentin Tarantino has said that when he read that review, even before he saw the movie, when he read that review, he thought, oh, well, this is what I'm going to do <laughs> with my career. <laughs> and uh, I have mixed feelings about Tarantino myself, but I think that's a wonderful case of, uh, a wonderful testimony both to uh, 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 the quality of a movie and to the, the, the passion it evokes in a critic. Uh, uh, as, uh, having done a lot of that criticism in my life, I was uh, very gratified to, to, to read that. Yeah, and just a, a little side note, uh, Tarantino actually came up with the idea for John Travolta and Uma Thurman to dance in Pulp Fiction based on the dance in Band of Outsiders. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, <laughs> direct inspiration. <laughs> well, but it's, it's so, two very different styles. Oh yeah. The French one and uh, French love rock and roll. They, <laughs> they always, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Travolta and Uma, that's mm -hmm. very different. Yeah. yeah, well, ultimately two different, very different director sensibilities, yeah. but it was, it was directly influenced by it. I think that that confirms that anything good that you find in a Tarantino movie, you can find slightly even better in an older movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, although I am a big fan of Jackie Brown, so I would, oh, yeah, I do like Jackie Brown. I love um, me too, I, me too, Michael. Yeah, that's that's. So that'll one. be our next time, right? <laughs> right. I want to just say thank you so much for taking the time. Everybody taking the time to. Yes. watch this old movie and enjoy it with us and um we're gonna have some more great stuff for the lumiere club coming up um and we have some wonderful um living room programs coming up as well diana taylor who's one of our family members is going to be with paul next friday um with a film that she shot uh, and directed years ago and has been a little hard to find. She made it for the, for network TV and then it kind of disappeared and we've revived it thanks to it's Paul. It's called Diana. Vanished. It's called Vanished. And wow. it's a Southwestern <laughs> film. And Michael, we will invite you to join us because I think you'll really enjoy it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I hey, before we go, before we go, can I just uh, uh, put in a, uh, uh, a plug for Michael? Uh, Michael writes this column in Film Comment Magazine called Deep Focus 
which is on the website. And, and folks, honestly, Michael is a great, great writer, a great uh, film critic. And uh, you, should, you should take a, a peek at some of, his, some of his reviews. They're all on the website. You can go into past years and any movies that you want to uh, find out. Um, Michael uh, is just a really extraordinary writer. So, so please uh, uh, take a, a peek at, at some of his work because it's really wonderful. And we'll cross our we'll cross our fingers that film comment will survive the COVID crisis and yes, uh, and that you'll be able to do some more sometime because um, like a lot of things, it's been put on hiatus. It's it's um, a, a sad moment, and I think people are afraid for its future. So it's mm -hmm. been a it's been a, a, a at the core of cinephilia in America for I don't know how long, almost fifty years, Michael. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, since the. Uh... Oh, you know, this is very funny. The uh, uh, Dolores Hitchens, who wrote Fool's Gold, uh, her husband um, uh, had a son named Gordon Hitchens. Um, and Gordon Hitchens was actually the founder of Film Comment. In the oh, right. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, so to bring together. this full circle. Yes, exactly. <laughs> thank you, everybody. And we'll see you very soon. All okay. right. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, guys. That was a lot of fun. Thanks, Mike. It really was. Okay. I'll talk to you soon.